Monitor Lizard is already popular. They can be called the Lizard King because of how advanced they are compared to the other lizards. They probably are the most studied lizard, so we know a lot about them. There are a lot of videos on monitor lizards already on YouTube, but surprisingly, not a lot talk about their biology. Most are on the pet category. And so, I'm making this video. Hope it's not too long. Um, yeah, post editing Opzu here. Apparently it's over 40 minutes, so buckle up I guess. Without further ado, let me brought up the question. What exactly is monitor lizard? <coughs> monitor lizards are lizards in the familia Faranidae. All of their extant species are classified in one genus, Faranus. It came from the Arabic word, waral, which is basically what the Arabs called them. Monitor lizards are called that way because they look as if they are monitoring the environment, since they usually walk relatively slowly while eyeing the surroundings left and right. Naturally, they are currently distributed in the Paleotropical and Australian region, but they can also be found around the world, as pets, kept in zoos, or even unwanted presence. They are opportunistic predators meaning they basically eat anything that can be swallowed by them, even eggs and carrions. Even so, there are few exceptions. I'll talk about that later in the video. They could live and traverse different terrains. Some are specialized climbers, while some are specialized swimmers. But in general, all of them can climb and swim. When they swim, they fold their legs behind and do lateral undulating like fishes and snakes. Even though all of them are on the same genus, they are actually quite diverse. Their characteristics match their lifestyle of course, just like any other animals. So let's talk about it. You can basically guess the lifestyle of monitor lizards based on several characteristics, which are their head and teeth, including nostrils, their legs and claws, and their tails. Monitor lizards with bigger heads tend to eat bigger and or harder prey. Those that eat hard-shelled prey have thicker skull. Meanwhile, those with smaller and slenderer head usually eat smaller prey that hide in holes or crevices. Monitor lizards' teeth are replaced at regular intervals throughout their life. Most monitor lizards have curved and serrated teeth, like the one you see in sharks. Some of the bigger ones like the Komodo dragon's teeth, have a very strong serration. Even so, their teeth are not really used to cut prey. They use it to deliver a killing bite and then hold their prey for a moment, often shaking it wildly, before finally swallowing it whole. Even so, some more specialized groups can have varying teeth. Some have blunt teeth. Some have straight teeth. Those will be explained later in the video. Their nostrils can either be a simple round hole or can be a slit. Those that have a slit like nostrils are usually those that search prey by digging or those that live in the desert region. The narrow slit like nostril prevent debris from entering. The nostril can also be positioned closer to their eye or to the tip of their snout. The one closer to their eyes are usually those who digs to search for prey so that they could insert their snout deeper into the soil. Meanwhile, the one closer to the tip are usually specialized swimmers, so they can breathe with ease while swimming. These are also equipped with skin flaps to prevent water from entering. Legs and claws are also intuitive. Those that spend more time on land have a stout and strong legs, with relatively short digits. Specialized climbers have slender and longer digits, so they could grasp branches better. Diggers have larger claws, usually relatively straight, while climbers have more curved claws. In general, their claws are really sharp. If you let them crawl on you, be prepared to get a lot of scratches. A deep one, that is. Their tail is usually at least half their total length but some species have shorter tail. They use this strong tail to attack, like a whip, 
a really strong whip that is. Their tail is also important for swimming. Swimmers have a laterally compressed tail, usually also with a heightened caudal crest. The more compressed, the higher tendency for them to be semi-aquatic. Arboreal monitors have prehensile tail. That means they can use their tail to grasp. In this case, they use it to grasp branches. Larger species have a strong tail that can support them when standing. Yes, you heard that right. Standing. Just look at this. It's called tripoding. More on this later. Now, let's talk about their diversity. While yes, all of the extant monitor lizard is grouped inside the same genus, they are divided into 11 subgenera. And so, I'm gonna talk about them one by one, starting from the westernmost group. The first is the Polydaedalus. They are mid to relatively big sized. Their distribution is concentrated in Africa, mostly Middle and Southern Africa, but the Yemen monitor lives in Yemen and Saudi Arabia. As you might be able to imagine, they live in the drier region, mostly sub savanna. What's quite unique about them is their teeth. While most monitor lizards have a uniformly shaped teeth, the polydaedalus have a more diverse tooth. Their front teeth are similar to other monitor lizards, sharp, serrated, and curved. Meanwhile, the hind teeth are bigger and relatively blunt, especially in adults. They are generalists, so the variety of teeth help a lot. Some of their diets are hard-shelled animals, even turtles and tortoises. So their blunt teeth can be used to break the cell, just like many other durophagus animals. Their builds are relatively robust, with stout head and legs with strong claw, as they also tend to dig to find prey. And so, their narrow nostrils are situated closer to their eye to prevent debris from entering. They have a laterally compressed tail with a crest, as they are relatively good swimmers too. Their members are quite popular around the world, as they are often kept as pets. For example, the white-throated monitor and the black-throated monitor, which is the same species, Pharanus albigularis. These are mostly durophagus. The savanna monitor is also popular as they are in the relatively smaller size. The Nile monitor is very popular, maybe too popular, both famous and infamous that is. They tend to stay near water and prefers to eat aquatic food. Next is the Samosaurus, desert monitor. They live in the desert regions of northern Africa to Middle Asia. Their lifestyle is more or less the same as the Polydaedalus, so their build is also relatively similar, except for their diets. They mostly eat small things and almost never eat hard-shelled animals, so their head is relatively slender with uniform teeth, sharp and curved. Same as the majority of monitor lizards. While they are believed to be monotypic for a long time, they might actually be more diverse. In 2015, a relatively new species was proposed, called the Pharanus nesterovi. So who knows, maybe more species in the future? Let's see. Next is the Empagusia mid to big sized monitor lizards that are distributed from South Asia to Southeast Asia. They are semi-arboreal, so they spend a lot of time on trees. Which is why, their claws are relatively more curved compared to the previous two subgenera. Curved claws help them cling and climb trees. Even so, lifestyle is quite different between each other. Some like drier place, so they walk a lot while other prefer swampy region, and they swim a lot. They kinda have this jack-of-all-trade lifestyle, so their nostrils are located around the middle part of their snout. This group is quite confusing though, as they are not really monophyletic. Some members are even closer to the Soterosaurus, which is the next subgenus that I will talk about. But first, let's talk about some of the members of Empagusia. The Dumeril monitor is mainly durophagus, 
but they don't have blunt teeth like the polydaedalus. Instead of crushing the shell of its prey, they just pierce it with their very sharp teeth. The roughneck monitor is quite popular. As their namesake, they have sparse but large tuberculous scale on their neck, especially their nape. Alright, let's move on to Soterosaurus. Soterosaurus is the water monitor. Their distribution is similar to the Empagusia, but with different niche. As their name, they are semi-aquatic. They live near fresh water and spend a lot of time swimming. Their nostrils are located near the tip of their snout to help them breathe while swimming. They are quite big, averaging 1.5 to 2 meters length, but some can grow to around 3 meters, especially those that live in big rivers or lakes. Their tail is very laterally compressed, with high caudal crest, very specialized for swimming. Not only are they excellent swimmers, they are good climbers and really strong. Trust me, I'm speaking through experience here. They are generalists and opportunists, so basically they eat everything that can pass through their throat. Insects, eggs, carrions, even birds, your pets, your livestock, really, anything. Bad news is, they are very inquisitive, and they will find a way to enter your chicken coop. The bigger one doesn't even avoid human. They will just bask under the sunlight or even walk past you calmly. Asians will understand. Anyway, their most famous member is the Asian water monitor, Varanus alfator. It's the second largest living lizard. Somehow, they are quite popular as pet. Maybe because they are easily obtained and can grow quite big. Next is the Filipinosaurus. As the name suggests, they are endemic to the Philippines. Their build is like a hybrid between the Empagusia and the Soterosaurus. They are big, usually grows up to 2 meters. They are a lot more arboreal though. Most of their life are spent on trees. What's special about them is they are frugivores which means they eat fruit, which is why their large intestine is longer than other monitor lizards. They also have cecum. Also, unlike most monitor lizards, when they feel threatened, they don't counterattack nor frantically escape. Instead, they tend to remain immobile, blending themselves to the background. I believe there are only three species in this subgenus, which are Pharanus olifaceus, the grace monitor, Pharanus mabitang, and Pharanus bitatawa. Pharanus mabitang is strictly frugivorous, while the other two sometimes still eat insects, snails, and other small stuffs. Grace monitor is also known to have blunt teeth, similar to the polydaedalus. Moving back to the south, it's the Eupripiosaurus. It consists of the Pharanus indicus species group which are semi-arboreal, semi-aquatic monitor lizards. They are distributed from eastern Indonesia to Oceania. They live in mangroves, so you could either find them chilling on the mangroves or swimming under. These ones are mid-sized and slender, usually around 1 meter. Their overall build is kinda similar to the juvenile of Soterosaurus. Eupripiosaurus is one of the most diverse subgenus, Maybe number two in terms of that. Their most famous member is the mangrove monitor itself, Pharanus indicus. Some members are very colorful, like the three colored monitor, Pharanus yuonoi. As their namesake, they got three colors. You could even argue they have four, or even more, depending on how nitpicky you wanna be. Oh, and I think Pharanus jobiensis is also popular. That is the peach throated monitor. The name speak for itself, I guess. No need to add anything to that. Moving to the far east, enter the Hapturosaurus. They are the true tree monitors. You can find them around the New Guinea and northern Australia. They are small to mid sized and very slender, as they are very specialized for arboreal lives. Their digits are also long and slender with strongly curved claws. Their tail is long and not compressed at all, and it is prehensile. They are very protective of their tail, 
as it is important to grasp trees. Instead of using it to attack when threatened, they tuck it in or roll it so it's not damaged. They could also support their body with their tail to stand. But instead of surfing as a stand like a tripod, they do so by tightly grasping onto branches. They also do this when engaging male-to-male -male combat during mating season. More on this later. They exhibit a behavior called extractive foraging, where they insert their limbs and heads to tree holes to search for insects. While they are not adapted for swimming at all, they are occasionally observed swimming. They even have been seen doing underwater foraging, where they look for food underwater. They consist of the Pharanus prasinus species group, with some members being popular as pets. They kinda looks like copies of Pharanus prasinus, each with different colors, which is why collectors love them, I think. Next is the Papusaurus. As written on their name, they are the Papuan Monitor, or perhaps better known as New Guinea, more specifically, along the southern coast. Based on records, they are the longest lizard. Yes, the longest, but not the biggest, as they are relatively slender and lightweight compared to others with similar length. Some say they can grow to more than 4 meters. A report even said a specimen is almost 5 meters, but it's unverified. If I said the Hapturosaurus have long tail, the Papusaurus have even longer tail. Their tail is at least two-thirds of their entire length. As they grow older, the proportion increase. They have this unique look to them, with those squarish blunt snout, which is why they are called the crocodile monitor. There is only one species in this subgenus. Even though they might look sluggish, they are actually quite agile. Their teeth are also unique among the monitor lizards. The teeth are long and straight, useful when holding on to fast-moving prey. Instead of following or chasing their prey from behind, crocodile monitors usually anticipate the movement and ambush them ahead. They are also very adapted to arboreal life, so their tail is cylindrical and prehensile, like the Hapturosaurus, but they still use it to attack. In the Solomon Island archipelago live the Solomonosaurus, also with only one species, Pharanus pinolosus. What's unique about them is their scale. Their dorsal, neck, and caudal scales are strongly conical and highly keeled. It basically means the scales are spiny, hence their species name. Their behavior is basically similar to the Eupripiosaurus which are the mangrove monitors, which is why they were once considered to be the subspecies of Pharanus indicus, but is now considered a different species, different subgenus even. The tenth subgenus is Odatria, usually called the dwarf monitors. Lizards in this group are small, at least among the monitor lizards. One of their members is the smallest monitor lizard, Pharanus parnus, which is only around 20 centimeters. This group is generally divided into two subgroups, which are the Pharanus acanthurus species group and the Pharanus tristis species group. The acanthurus group usually lives in the rocky and arid region of Australia. Meanwhile, the tristis group usually live in more humid areas, like the savanna woodlands of northern Australia and southern New Guinea. The Acanthurus group usually have spiny tail. This spiny tail is used to wedge themselves in rock crevices, usually even used to block the entrance of their burrow when they sleep. It's also used as a weapon, like a mace. They also use their tail to swipe prey out of crevices if they couldn't reach it, like this one. They usually are an active forager, usually feeding on arthropods, but also small lizards and mammals. The most popular member of them is the name holder itself, Pharanus acanthurus, or commonly known as the Aki monitor. Aki monitor is probably the most popular monitor to be kept as pets. I'm pretty sure there are many videos of them on YouTube, so if you are interested, go look at them I guess. The Tristis group is on the bigger side, usually are more semi-arboreal, some even semi-aquatic. 
they are also very fast, which is why they are difficult to be observed and captured. The most popular member of this group is of course the name holder itself, Varanus tristis. Fun fact, tristis means sad, and they are often called the mournful monitor. It's just because their coloration is dark, like they are currently mourning. They are probably the most widely distributed monitor in Australia. Oh, and they are also known as the racehorse monitor, because they are very fast. Last, but definitely not least, is the Faranus, the true monitors. They are big monitors with robust body. Most of them, if not all, are the apex predator of their respective area. They have strong and sharp curved claws, which make them a good climber and diggers. And also, they have a laterally compressed tail, which make them a good swimmer. So they are good at everything. Not the best, but definitely more than good enough. Their members often have a habit of tripoding. They stand up with their tail on the ground like a third leg to look at the surrounding. For younger individuals, this might look funny, or even cute, but imagine the large adult, more than 2 meters, doing this in front of you. That's quite menacing, isn't it? Their members are really popular. For example, the Argus monitor, Lace monitor, the Parenti, and what might be the most famous lizard, the Komodo dragon. Even the extinct but famous Megalania prisca, now validly named Pharanus priscus, is a member of this subgenus. These members have varying lifestyle too. Some prefer to roam the land, while some loves being in the water, like the Merton's water monitor. What's quite unique about the Merton's water monitor is that their nostril is located on top of their snouts, like in crocodiles which enables them to breathe with ease while swimming. Now, let's talk about their senses. Their eyes are well developed. They are capable of detecting slight movement from over 50 meters distance. Some even can detect threat from over 200 meters in open areas. Even so, their eyes are built for daytime as they are diurnal animals. Their sight is really bad in the dark, but most of the time, that's not a problem for them, as their main sense is of smell and taste, the olfactory. They have a well-developed Jacobson's organ, just like snake. Their tongue is also long and forked, like snakes. The forked tongues enable them to detect more particles from a precise angle. That's why, you'll see them flicking their tongue basically every time. Some species like the Komodo dragon is said to even be able to detect prey from few kilometers away, in the right condition that is. Their tactile sense is decent. In some cases, they also stay calm if you rub their back. I think this is related to their social status, especially during mating season. More on this later. Compared to their other senses, their hearing is bad. They also don't vocalize much. They only make hissing sound. Oh, I almost forgot. They also have parietal eye. That is this thing on top of their head. These are not true eye, but it functions as light receptor. It basically tells them whether there is a light source on top of them or not. It has a role in their circadian rhythm. It might also help them detect threat or predators to some extent. Like, imagine if something swoops down on them from above. Light will be blocked, and so, they could detect that and run away. For defense, they have osteoderms, that is, bones underneath the skin. Think of it like a chainmail. This varies between species. Some have very few of it. Others, especially the Komodo dragon, have a lot on their body. Adults also have more developed osteoderms than juveniles. Some of them also have coloration that blends with the environment. Smaller monitors will usually run away or hide when threatened. Some will hiss and bluff by puffing their throat to make them look bigger. Some might become aggressive and attack, especially the bigger one. Their main weapons are their teeth, claws, and tail. They use their tail as a whip. 
you might be surprised how fast and strong this is. Some don't though, as I've stated before in this video. Teeth and claws are obvious. They are sharp. Trust me, been bitten several times by wild monitors. Also, they don't just simply bite. They chomp on you hard, and they thrash around trying to rip your flesh. Also, some of you might have heard of the venom versus bacteria debate. So let's talk about that. So, do they have venom or bacteria? Well, the answer is simply, they have both. Indeed, monitor lizards have septic saliva. They obtain this bacterial colony from eating carrions and from other monitors' mouths. Uh, no, I don't mean mouth-to-mouth -mouth transfer. When a monitor lizard bite their prey and it didn't die, the prey will escape and the monitor lizard will stalk it until it died. What? Wait a minute, is that a deer? Oh no. <clears throat> Sorry. So, in many cases, other monitor lizards will also stalk that prey. And so, when another monitor bites in, the bacteria from the wound will then be transferred to the new monitor lizard. Even so, there is no unique bacteria that can be considered as a fatal weapon for them. Besides that, they also have venom. While it is believed to not be a highly potent venom, cases of severe effects on humans had been reported several times. A 55-year-old woman had experienced acute kidney injury after being bitten by a Bengal monitor. A 12-year-old child had experienced severe pain, vomiting, bleeding gum, and hematuria after being bitten by a monitor lizard. So, whether it's being caused by the septic saliva, or the venom, or both, the point is, their bite can be severe in some cases. Analysis on the functionality of several venoms from different species of monitor lizards had been done. It shows that the venom can block platelet aggregation, cleave and destroy fibrin again, and so, disrupt blood clotting. What might be surprising is, Komodo dragon's venom is not even the most potent. The most potent venom belongs to the Odatria and Hapturosaurus group. Those are the arboreal monitors. They might need more potent venom because they couldn't bother chasing prey that escaped to the ground. Besides for harming prey, their venom might also assist digestion, because some of them eat large food. So, let's talk about their feeding habit. Monitor lizards are usually active forager. That means, they actively seek and chase prey. When they bite prey, they bite hard and thrash them around to kill them. I've seen a monitor lizard use their claw to slit a mice's throat. So yeah, that works too. When the prey dies, they then proceed to swallow them whole. Large monitors, like the Komodo dragon, can even eat larger sized prey. Usually, they bite once and then let them go. This one bite can be quite damaging, sometimes even breaking bones. They then trail the prey until it died. After that, eating time. W whoa is that a deer? Okay, producer, you're just bullying me right now. Anyway, they usually swallow a prey hole as I've said before, but in some cases, they don't. For example, when several monitors are feasting on a single animal, in this case, they will rip flesh apart. Another case is when they just simply couldn't swallow it, like when they are eating sea turtles. First, they rip and swallow the head or limbs and then starts feasting through the cell opening. The aftermath is like what you could see in the recently viral tweet. Some monitors also forage underwater. When doing so, they close their eyes and don't flick their tongue at all. In a special case, specifically in Varanus Mertensi, they actually open their eye and still flick their tongue. Instead of active foraging, some are ambush predator, like the Varanus calories. They usually hide in tree holes until a prey came by. Almost all of them are opportunistic predators though, so they can switch feeding habit as they see fit. Monitor lizards don't usually drink water. Most of their water intake is from their food. Sometimes they are observed drinking though. They also have a nasal salt gland, at least some of them. That salt gland can pump salt out of their body if needed. This enables them to survive in brackish or even salt water. Also make it safe to eat a lot of marine animals. 
As many other animals, monitor lizards mostly reproduce sexually. Males are bigger than female. Males are very territorial. They will mark their territory with their sand gland by rubbing. During mating season, males usually engage in male-to-male -male combat. They will body each other while standing, like wrestling. Some people might think it looks like they are hugging. In smaller species, they might do so while rolling on the ground. During this combat, biting and clawing might happen, but never lethal. The winner will get the privilege to mate. A lot of the time, dominant male will lay on top of the loser male to assert dominance. This can also be seen as advertisement to females. In some species, the lesser male will rub the head or tail of the dominant male, also as advertisement to females. Male monitor lizards have hemipenis, just like other lizards. It's basically a branched penis. Meanwhile, females have hemiclitoris. Their hemipenis are equipped with several accessories. They have parifasma, which are these folds. They also have hemibacula. I made a video about baculum before. So, hemibacula is basically the baculum of hemipenis. This hemibacula usually protrudes on the tip of their hemipenis. So the tip have this spikes thing. Sometimes, they also have multiple hooks on their hemipenis. These accessories have a function, of course, mainly to keep them inside females. To not sleep away, you know, just like in cats. Arboreal monitors usually mate on trees, so it's even more important for them. With how complex and diverse the hemipenis shapes are, they're even used as a basis for classification. Monitor lizards are oviparous, so they lay egg. They lay their egg on their nest. Females will usually search for a suitable place before they lay eggs. While they don't incubate their egg, females usually watch over their egg to some extent. Most reproduction data are from captive monitors though, so we can't really be sure how it is in the wild. Hatchlings have a structure called egg tooth to help them break their egg shell from inside. This egg tooth will then disappear after a while. Some monitor lizards also have the capability of parthenogenesis, that is, asexual reproduction. They do so in a process called terminal fusion automixis. That's why, if they reproduce through parthenogenesis, all of their offsprings will be male. Why though? Let me explain it to you in a simple way. Hopefully, that is. Humans have a heterozygote male type of chromosome. You probably know that male sex chromosomes are noted as XY. Meanwhile, monitor lizards are heterozygote female. Their females are noted as ZW. This image shows different method of reproduction. The left one is the normal process. The middle and right are parthenogenesis. What happened to the monitor lizards are the middle one. So, just think of the blue colored chromosomes as Z and the red colored as W. At the end of automixis, each of the produced gamete will fuse with each other. In terminal fusion, both gamete on the same side will fuse with each other. So either the Z will fuse with Z, or the W will fuse with W, resulting in only ZZ and WW. WW is nothing, so it will not become an offspring. That's why all that's left are the ZZ offspring, which are males. In theory, one individual female can colonize a new island through parthenogenesis. Because their offsprings are male, those males can reproduce with their mother. That's just a hypothesis, of course. No real evidence of this happening. Monitor lizards rest in shelter. These shelter can be shrubs, tree hollows, crevices, and to some extent, water. They also use burrows made by other animals. For diggers, they could dig their own burrow. This burrow varies between species especially relative to their size. Usually, only one monitor stays in a burrow, but some can share it with others. Some can be quite complex. For example, this one made by Varanus guldi. Oh, and they also lay their egg in these nests. 
One of the things that makes monitor lizards successful is their metabolism and physiology. They have higher and more efficient metabolism than most reptiles. Usually, reptiles have three chambered hearts, except in crocodiles, that is. In monitor lizards, their ventricle is divided by a septum, so it's like a four chambered heart, but it's not perfect, of course. This makes their blood circulation more effective and efficient. Other major advantage they have is their respiration. Usually, when you chase a lizard, they will run away, and they are fast indeed. But for whatever reason, they will stop and not move at all after a short while. Try and see it for yourself. This happens because they cannot breathe while they move. The muscles used for breathing are also the muscles that move their front legs. Same with monitor lizards, of course, but the monitor lizards have a long neck. Usually, lizards only have 8 cervical vertebrae, some only 7. Meanwhile, the monitor lizards have 9. So, how is this relevant? Monitor lizards have long and strong neck muscles, and so, they can pump air in with their neck muscles, called cooler pumping. This enables them to breathe while running. Monitor lizards also have possible monary septum. It's a barrier between their lung and other visceral organs. The tensioning of the septum can help them breathe in more air. It basically has the same function as human's diaphragm. Monitor lizards are also known for their intelligence. Varanus albigularis had been observed to understand the concept of number and counting to some extent. They also able to solve some puzzles, usually for food or trying to escape their enclosure, like opening their cage. They are also known to be able to recognize their caretaker, some even seen playing to some extent. I know this don't sound amazing at all, but it actually is remarkable for a reptile. I've watched an old documentary covering this whole topic, including the solving puzzles part. I'll write the title or screenshot during editing if I'm able to find it, just in case you're curious and want to watch it yourself. Juveniles sometimes look very different from their adults. Ecologically, they sometimes fill a different niche. For example, juvenile water monitors usually perch on trees. Meanwhile, their adults spend a lot of time in water. Juveniles usually eat insects, while their adults eat varieties of food. In general, juveniles are more colorful, exhibiting more patterns. These patterns are usually faded in adults. In some species, juveniles have completely different coloration than their adult. I believe there is no definite answer to why, but a theory is... This different coloration help the adults recognize the juveniles. Adult monitor lizards are usually territorial. They often fight and chase away other individuals. Different coloration in juveniles might help adults recognize them as juveniles. And so, they will just let them be. Again, it's just a theory though. No real answer for this yet. While all extant monitor lizards are classified in one genus, there are several pharaonid fossils in different genus. Most of them are from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia, like Ovo and Iolosaurus. There are also several fossils of stem pharaonid from the Eocene of Europe, like Eosaniwa. But what might be the most interesting fossil is the fossil of Saniwa Ancidens from the Eocene of North America. This fossil is also the most complete fossil of stem pharaonid. And of course, the popular Megalania prisca from Australia, but it had been renamed into Pharanus priscus. There are also several extinct Pharanus fossil records. Based on these fossil records, you might have guessed that monitor lizards originated from Asia. And that's probably right. It's also supported by molecular analysis. The current monitor lizards probably originated from Asia and then some dispersed into Africa around 49 to 33 million years ago. Another dispersal happened around 39 to 26 million years ago, that is, from Asia to Australia. Some that evolved in Australia then returned to Indonesia. Hence why Komodo dragon fossils are also found in Australia. The current closest relative to the monitor lizards 
is the earless monitor lizard. Although they are called that way, they are not monitor lizards of course. They are classified in a different family, the Lantanotidae, with only one species, Lantanotus borneensis. If you watch from the start of this video, or you are familiar with monitor lizards in some ways, you might think snakes are also their close relative, since they share many characteristics. While yes, to some extent they are, but as of now, evidence shows that they are not a close relative at least not a sister group of monitor lizards. The closest relative to the monitor lizards are actually the mosasaurs. These are based on skeletal similarities of course, as we can't really analyze their DNA. As I've said several times before, many monitor lizards are popular as pets. And these could be a problem in some cases, like what happened to the Nile monitor. I believe Nile Monitor now live in the US as invasive species. While I personally never been there, I heard Florida have a lot of them. I'm not against those that keep Monitor Lizard as pet, but please, do be responsible to avoid this kind of occurrence. All Monitor Lizards are categorized in the Cytis Appendices. All except 5 species are categorized in Cytis Appendix 2, which means they can be traded by captive breeders by providing the necessary documents. The five species exceptions are Pharanus bengalensis, Pharanus flavescens, Pharanus griseus, Pharanus commodoensis, and Pharanus nebulosus. They are categorized in Cites Appendix 1. That means they cannot be traded commercially, but they can be exported and imported for specific reason, such as research. For this, both the importer and exporter need to provide documents and be granted the permit. Looking at the species, you might be able to guess that these are those which populations are threatened to decline. Most species are categorized and the least concerned by the IUCN red list. Exceptions exist, of course. The obvious one is the Komodo dragon. They are categorized as endangered. Paranus micheli is even categorized as critically endangered. Unfortunately, a lot of monitor lizards are smuggled to be traded because they are popular as pet. So again, I'm not against those that keep monitor lizards as pet, but please do be responsible. While we are talking about monitor lizards, I would also mention briefly about the Mertens Index. This index is used to describe and identify monitor lizard species. If you read publications on monitor lizard species description, you will most likely see this index. Some publication will list the code and their meaning, like this for example. But some might not. So be prepared to look at other publications. I think it originated from Die Familie der Warane by Robert Mertens. But I'm not sure, might be wrong. Monitor lizard is one of my favorite animals, maybe my second favorite. I read about them a lot when I was still an undergraduate student around 9 years ago. I even have a notebook dedicated for writing notes on what I've learned about monitor lizards. Right now it's collecting dust somewhere, I guess. So I have quite the history with them. Got bitten by them several times, got a fever from their bites. I even took a photo with them during my master's degree graduation. Unfortunately, I haven't had the time to learn about them recently, as most of my research are on deer. So this video is like a nostalgia for me, recalling what I've learned and looking at recent publications. If you are still watching up till now, then hey, congratulations, you've reached the end. I hope you learned something new from this. Alright. That's all for now.